David Rockwell. So you, so you, uh, I'm just going to do that. It goes orange and red. Orange is? No, red is that. And orange is slide quicker? Orange is nice. Orange is? Orange is nice. Don't judge focus. A lot of rules. Um, well, I want to start out by making a confession, which who here w uh, was at Technotainment in New York? Um, those of you who were there know this, those of you who are not, uh, I'm here to admit today that I am a total live theater addict. Um, I've tried some 12-step programs, tried to deal with it, and the fact of the matter is it's just something that I'm very, very passionate about, and it seems to make sense to talk about it here because TED is such incredible live theater. I think that uh, all the discussion about connectivity that I've heard in the last couple days makes me think about the ability for live theater to connect us emotionally, to reach inside and move us in a way that other art forms can't. When you think about movies, for instance, movies are essentially about looking and listening. Live theater demands something of the audience. Live theater depends for its outcome on us interacting. And I also think that live theater fills an almost primal need we have for astonishment, for amazement to be transported. Um, when you think about the buildings, the theaters uh, that this astonishment takes place in, for an architect, this is a great opportunity. This is a chance to shape those spaces that encourage our emotional connection. They encourage that complex relationship that happens in a theater, not just between the audience and the performer, but between the audience and the audience. Now, that's obviously not an abstract issue to anyone here because there's a reason why we're here. We could see this on CD-ROM. We wouldn't get the hats, but we'd still see the same conference. We're here because of the net sum of the whole experience. We're here because of the anticipation downstairs, the schmoozing, the networking in the lobby, the thrill we hear when we hear the Aida music. In my case, it was terror because I knew I had to get up here and speak. But there is an emotional reaction we feel to that music. Uh, and also, all of that adds up to creating a very complex network. Um, we've had uh, the extraordinary opportunity in the last couple years to combine what I'm addicted to and my passion to what I do for a living. We've designed several theaters. Uh, we just completed a theater for Cirque du Soleil in Orlando uh, that Patrick Berger, who we collaborated with, is going to show and talk about a little bit. And what an amazing opportunity to understand astonishment. I mean, Cirque communicates with people in such a powerful way. To create the building that allows that to happen was an amazing opportunity. Uh, we're also restoring Radio City Music Hall in partnership with Hugh Hardy, one of the amazing spaces on the planet, I think. Uh, and lastly, we're doing a new theater in Los Angeles for the Academy Awards, uh, which I'm going to show a little bit on later. So I want to do a quick. Uh, look at some theater spaces that are particularly moving and how they support live theater. And uh, since I'm not a theater historian, they are largely chronological. Uh, the important thing, I think, is to look at how the form of theater throughout the ages has changed enormously. It's changed based on economics. It's changed based on religion. It's changed based on increasing demand for more spectacle. It's changed based on more technology. Theater and technology have a very close relationship, and it's changed based on social status, all kinds of things, but it's what's remained the same. And it's amazing that live theater has survived given the competition from the movies, television, from the, the web. What's remained the same is its ability when it worked to touch us deeply. So let's start with some slides. Maybe we could dim the lights a little bit. Could we dim these up here a little more? Theater at its, at its earliest form is obviously just storytelling. And uh, in terms of facilities, the only thing that was needed was a space for the audience, a space for the performer. Uh, and uh, that was it. Very few props, very few. How do I make this thing go forward? The Greeks had the challenge of taking this form of communication and multiplying it 25,000 times. 
communicating to all of these people, this amphitheater-like form focuses attention on the stage. And I think what's powerful about this is the epic poems, the tragedies, the rip your eyes out Oedipus-like stories that they told were all about man's uh, uh, essential helplessness in the face of the gods. And the fact that this was told in these spaces open to the gods, dwarfing the scale of the people, made it particularly powerful. Uh, medieval passion plays, different God, same story. God here is kind of the church, is the, is the main patron of the theater, and uh, the altar was the place where that theater took place. Can we back up on that a little bit so we see the whole thing? Uh, even back in uh, passion plays, technology was what supported spectacle. This was in demand of spectacle so you could connect with the, with the experience. This was a copper ball that would descend from the church, kind of a descendant to Andrew Lloyd Webber's chandelier, I guess, and angels would come from above. Well, these passion plays outgrew the churches and moved into town squares. And now we're talking about amazing uh, communities. I mentioned theater as a communal shared experience. The entire town would put on these plays that would last up to a week. And uh, what was interesting is that the audience and the performer were in this kind of dance where the, the audience would move around these passion wagons. Um, seems to me that if you think about environmental theater in a town square, cut forward to Times Square and take the church as the patron and substitute Disney and Live Vent, there's certainly some kind of overlap here. The Globe Theater, can we focus that a little bit? Globe theater started to take the form, and class distinction was one of the defining forms of the theater, with the lower area for the groundlings, or the less expensive people standing up. The perimeter bleachers were more expensive seats, and then dead center, uh, where the queen and her most important court members would sit. This was about theater for the whole day. This was uh, anyone who saw Shakespeare in Love uh, knows the power of this theater form. Prostitutes, hustlers, hookers, salesmen, jugglers. This was about spending the day with an incredible community. And in fact, if you look carefully at this drawing from that day and you look at the lower left hand piece, <laughs> I think the similarity between this and Ted is uh, clear. Well, uh, Post-Elizabethan theater, here we're looking at uh, class distinction being the defining form in theater, almost like the first corporate screening rooms. King sat front and center, and the balconies along the side were always an important part in framing the stage picture. When you think about differentiating theater from film, seeing people in your peripheral vision was an important factor early, early on. Well, that grew got more and more uh, demand for spectacle, more demand for public, more people along the side, but that peripheral view, that seeing people, uh, was always part of it. Well, I mentioned technology. Theater really has fostered state-of-the-art technology, and believe it or not, in 1650, this was state-of-the-art technology. This was dimming equipment, and lighting is a way to allow scenes to shift from one to the other and kind of simulate uh, the suggestion of what would be cinematic techniques. More and more spectacle, more and more demand, more and more public. The theater went from a single point perspective to these Baroque environments. And I think what's fascinating is the hand of the engineer uh, in creating this spectacle. The technology demand to create spectacle kind of created what, what I call the aesthetic of astonishment, where clouds would break loose, angels would descend, uh, just an amazing immersive experience that would transport people to another time and place. A plan of Wagner in 1850's idea of theater, he had a very different idea. And he came up with the idea of opera and theater being hard work. You were supposed to be focused on the performance, as little distraction as possible, nothing on the sidewalls. It's as if he saw the theatrical experience as a one-on-one -on -one relationship to the stage. And the reason this is important is so much of the theaters built in the 1970s that are essentially failures followed this model, including, uh, th this is now the model really for movie theaters. No side boxes, no frills, no view, no fun. 
Hitler thought this was just dandy. He loved Richard Wagner. It's almost a reaction to that. The rest of Europe said, you know what? Opera really and theater is not about a one-on-one -on -one experience. It's about as much distraction as possible. We want to see people. We want activity. We want buzz. We want theater in every part of the experience, not just what's happening on stage. So that the boxes, what was happening in the boxes was as important as what was happening on stage. As an architect, the reason that's exciting is it was new pieces of the theater to design. In the Paris Opera House, the stair, the balconies, the pre-show was all as important as the actual theater space itself. So cut to the early 1900s. This is the New Amsterdam Theater recently restored by Hugh Hardy wonderfully. And technology, again, revolutionizes the ability to combine two things, the demand for spectacle and the demand for intimacy. If theater is about live interaction, no matter how big it gets, somehow you need to be able to touch what's happening on stage. So the cantilevered balcony that allowed uh, huge overhangs, people to be in closer contact with the stage, as well as uh, melding the European opera box style so that when you look at the stage picture, you have activity on either side augmenting what's happening on the stage. This is an amazing example. This is the Hippodrome from the early 1900s in New York. And the Hippodrome was huge. The stage was 12 times the size of a normal stage. The proscenium was 200 feet wide. And this was kind of a frenzy in the early times of movies to compete with movies through literal stagecraft. Floods, earthquakes, hundred showgirls sinking at one time an interesting pre uh, precursor to Cirque du Soleil show in Las Vegas right now. Huge spectacle. Uh, the theater, ultimately, uh, th uh, theater could not compete with movies by trying to simulate what movies did. They had to find their own form again. Radio City Musical in 1935, these guys really understood this. Roxy Rothenthal's idea was this is a day in the country. Uh, he supposedly thought this up on a cruise in the ceiling with these incredible bands of color. The pre-show was glorious. And uh, in fact, he had a nervous breakdown opening night trying to put this together and he was thwarted in his attempt to really immerse people. He wanted to put nitrous oxide into the air conditioning system. <laughs> True story. And uh, one of the things that we're doing in restoring this is we're putting in the vacuum tubes from the original 1935 theater are still there. We're going to finally be able to do what the original uh, architect, what Donald Desky and Roxy Rothenthal wanted to do, which is have the ceiling just ablaze with multiple colors. Uh, this is uh, the O'Keeffe Theater in Toronto. And I think it's an example of what happens if you take the Vich Richard Wagner approach of focusing on the stage. You may have a great technical space for performance, but you don't have much fun, and you certainly don't have anything that, uh, that helps communication. The Amundsen Theater in Los Angeles, this was a theater that got so many complaints about the house that they actually decided to fix it in the middle of the 1900s, middle of 1990, 1995. What they did is re-rake the seats so that they were in closer contact to the stage, brought the balcony forward, created opera boxes along the side, brought the ceiling down. In other words, three-dimensionalized the relationships in the theater. And the last example I'm going to show before the Academy Awards is the Nottingham Royal Theater in England, which I just think is a beautiful jewel box and really looks at a three-dimensional space that, to me, uh, is magical and really encourages uh, kind of astonishment and, and disbelief. This is the best I could do for a segue slide to the Academy Awards. <laughs> the Academy Awards Theater is 3,300 seats, and one night a year will be used for the Academy Awards. The month before, it'll be a tribute to the nominees, and the rest of the year, it'll be a home for a major theatrical produ production like Ragtime or Lion King. And I assume will be a pilgrimage for those people who want to touch, I guess, the closest thing to our popular culture icons, which is movie stars. Oops. 
just quickly, uh, the, the theater is a sequence of spaces. And in terms of how it relates to the examples we've seen before, well, if there's ever been a project that wanted to take schmoozing and pre-show to an art form, it's the Academy Awards Theater. <laughs> Clearly, there's a high demand for spectacle here. And technology, uh, in many cases, is groundbreaking in terms of a theater uh, that is a live theater, but is essentially a TV studio. So the technology was, was quite tricky. Facade, which you'll see along Hollywood Boulevard, a long procession up a flight of stairs into a rotunda. The rotunda leads to a lobby, and the lobby opens up to the theater. <laughs> the macro schmooze, as we call it. <laughs> the facade, can we focus out a little bit? The facade suggests some of the ideas that fe feed through the whole project, and those ideas are of light, transparency, translucency, glimmer, illusion. The facade is mainly made up of an 80-foot tall cast glass drape that you enter through. A quick model of that shows five by 10 pieces of four-inch thick cast glass. And this is a sample of it. You'll see in a, in a video we're going to show at the end uh, how this works. It also works as a projection screen so that you can rear project images on it. Can we, this is not going to work even if we focus it, but let's try and focus it. The walls in the lobby are made out of millions of tiny glass beads. And the reason we wanted to do this is glass beads have what's called light gain. So when the light hits it, it will reflect, and you'll really be suspended in this glimmering space. We're also working with an artist named Liza Liu. I don't know if anyone knows her. Uh, she did an installation in Los Angeles called The Kitchen and works obsessively with beads. Uh, and she's doing these two fountains that are going to be in the lobby, frozen out of beads. The facade leads to this rotunda, a red terrazzo carpet leads up the stairs. The stairs lead to an open air rotunda with a cast glass frame that surrounds your opening into the theater. And then the theater itself, can we focus that a little? The theater itself is all about light and illusion and grandeur and creating a buzz, creating the environment in which you're willing to have this astonishing experience. The balcony fronts are cast glass, so you're surrounded by cast glass that traces the line of where people are. The proscenium is framed by a cast glass piece, and the ceiling and the walls are a basket weave piece that's open beyond, so there's infinite flexibility in rigging and lighting and the silver leaf frame of this is a cableway so that there's infinite positions for uh, cameras as well. There's a media cockpit in the center of the theater on hydraulics that will lower. Uh, and I'm going to show the video. Uh, thanks for listening. My feeling is this is one of those really great opportunities when what you're obsessed about or addicted, in my case, coincides with what you do for a living. Uh, so thanks for listening to it. Let's watch the video. We didn't do the graphics, by the way, and they're really, this is a rough cut. We're working backwards from the theater out to the facade.
Lots of chance to get a cocktail here. Those are the Liza Lou sculptures on either side. Stair in the lobby that collects, uh, uh, connects all the levels. And then into the main theater. Chandeliers by Jamie Carpenter. Thank <laughs> you.